Experience Life. How's everybody? Great to see you today. Also want to welcome those of you watching at Church Online or watching via video somewhere in West Texas. We are so glad that you're here today with us as well. Is it hot to anybody besides me? Not only inside but outside. What's the hot today? Anybody know high? Bunch of different opinions, but 100, anything over 100 is hot and it's hot in here. We got the ACs running, but it's still tough to cool it down. So feel free to fan. Our guest speaker may fan some with you today. But this is a week four of a series we've been in called The Power of Prayer, where we've been talking about the power of both personal and corporate prayer, because we believe in experience life that prayer is very powerful. Told you that uh, at the beginning, the series talk one, I talk some about corporate prayer, that we were going to have some special guests coming over the next couple of weekends. And we've had some awesome special guests, haven't we, over the last couple of weeks? These guys were good. Carl Toady from Trinity First Weekend who did a great job. Sam Douglas, Dr. Sam Douglas, church planning coach of mine on our board of directors last weekend spoke, I know, spoke to many of us, especially those of us dealing with some really difficult stuff. And so it was awesome to hear from him. If you've missed any of the messages, please know you can always grab them on our website at experiencelifenow.com. We've got videos there, podcasts, the audio version, whatever you need, it's there on our website. But I'm really excited about the special guest that we have in the house with us today. His name is Russ Murphy. He is currently a singer, songwriter, and speaker out of Nashville, uh, Tennessee. Won a bunch of awards. He's, he is awesome and, and very famous. Right, Russ? And uh, so you guys are going to enjoy hearing from him. He's formerly a college minister at Indiana Avenue Baptist Church here in town. And when I was in college, I was in his college ministry. And he and his wife, Sarah Lynn, who's here with them, have just had a tremendous impact on my life. He was kind of the first to believe in me and give me the opportunity to lead. Uh, he kind of taught me some about playing guitar and leading worship. And so I led worship uh, for him in his college ministry for a while. And I was an associate there. And I just, without him and his influence in my life, I don't even know how I would have known how to do what we're doing now. Like he taught me how to lead a worship service. So, so thankful to him and to Sarah Lynn. E-Life would definitely uh, not be here without them. And so we're glad to have him here today. But I'm going to read a text of scripture that he's going to be speaking from uh, to you right now. And he's going to come up. And I know you guys will help me welcome him. So Luke chapter 11 beginning in verse 5, is on page 79. If you're in one of the blue ones, we've got some easy to understand New Testaments there in the back. If you don't have a Bible or if it's not in a translation, you understand very well. Page 79 there, but he's speaking out of Luke 11, beginning in verse 5, says this. Jesus was asked by his disciples, you know, how do, how do we pray? Teach us to pray. He went through the Lord's Prayer, and then we get to verse 5. Then he said to them, suppose one of you, has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey. I have nothing to set before him. From inside he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Jesus speaking. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now suppose one of the fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Uh, he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? Verse 13, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Powerful text, let me pray and Russ is gonna come. Jesus, thank you so much for this text of scripture and for what you're gonna to say to us today. We look forward to hearing from you. We wanna do whatever you tell us to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would y'all help me give a warm, experienced life welcome to Russ Murphy. Hello. There you go, Chris. That's cool. Man, I'm excited to be here. And I will tell you, Chris gives me too much uh, uh, praise on that. Chris, God has just worked with him in an amazing, amazing way. I'm just proud to be here today. I was back there chewing on one of these things, and I said, Chris, this is the lousiest bubble gum. He said, they're earplugs. I said, oh, give me a break. <laughs> I've never been to a place that had earplugs like that. I'm a guitar player. Too loud is not the same. Nothing's ever too loud for me. I like it all loud like that. Growing up on Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton, that's what I played growing up. So, Moved to Nashville five years ago, and uh, one of the first things a man told me in our house was this. He said, I'm not sure where you're from, Mr. Murphy, but I need to tell you about Nashville, Tennessee. Number one, in the summertime, it gets really hot. <laughs> then he said it gets really windy, and it gets really dusty. And I said, sir, I came from the king of hot dust, Lubbock, Texas. And uh, 
I think it's supposed to get like to 109 tomorrow. I'm bringing a coat. Good night. It'll be freezing. I love, your, I love your series on prayer. You've had some wonderful speakers come here, and now you've got a guitar player speaking today. It could be dangerous, but uh, I'll tell you, I believe in prayer. I really do, and I love prayer. I've seen some miracles happen through prayer. I bet you have too, but I'm going to talk to you today about the problems I have with prayer that are addressed here in these verses. I have some problems with prayer sometime. And first of all, this is a very funny story as Christ was telling the disciples there. As he was telling, they were laughing about this because you had a man coming to a home at midnight asking for three loaves. And the man inside who was trying to get everybody to sleep, he had just got his kids down. They had chickens in there. They're all sleeping in the same bed. Everybody is just calm now. The chickens are asleep. Everybody's quiet. And then, hey, open up. And the guy's going, shut up. The kids are going to. And finally, it says in verse 8 that it wasn't because they were friends that he answered this guy's request. It was because you kept bugging him all the time. It's, the, the guys were laughing about this. And remember the culture back then. In that culture, whenever somebody came to you to, as a guest, you were obligated to feed them, to give them drink, to give them housing. It was a, it was, you had to do it. If you've been to the Middle East right now, even places like Italy, I want to tell you, when they come in, they will feed you, and they will feed you and feed you. I guarantee you, man versus food. Adam Richmond has no clue what's going to go on there. There's so much food. And they give you drinks there, too, before you preach. And most of the time, it's Coke and orange auto. But sometimes, I got a hold of some stuff with a kick to it that all I know is during my, my sermon, I kept laughing. <laughs> what did they give me? They would just beat the credit out of, you know, whatever, so... I'm going to tell you three things I don't like about prayer. I have problems with prayer. It's all my problem, okay? I promise you. The first one is this. I have a real problem praying for myself. I have a real problem praying for me and my needs. I feel selfish. I feel guilty. I feel like I'm so blessed anyway. You know, if you come to me and say, Russ, I've got cancer, I'll pray for you. If you come to me and say, I need a job, I'll pray for you. If you say, I've got unwanted facial hair, I'll pray the hair falls out. You know, I will do that for you. But praying for me, I'm going, oh, that's not good. But Christ says here, I want you to pray for yourself boldly. That's why he said he came at midnight asking for three loaves. and He was persistent the whole, pray for yourselves. All through the Bible, you read about it. In uh, John 15, 7, what does it say? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. That sounds pretty selfish to me, but Christ told me to pray that way. There's time to do that. Psalm 37 and 4 says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That sounds like a selfish prayer to me. And Christ is saying, go ahead and pray it. I'm telling you to, it's okay. And I'll tell you three reasons why. First of all, the Lord loves to bless his children. He is your heavenly father. You know, no, God likes to beat me up and spank me. Well, no, <laughs> he likes to discipline me. He'll do it. But God also loves to bless his kids. You're one of his kids. He wants to bless you. Go to a young family at Christmas time, and you got a mom and dad about 27, 28, and they got some little kids there. You watch the parents. They have more fun at Christmas than the kids do. They got the camcorders. They're recording every second because they love that their kids are being blessed. They love the fact they love that. God wants to bless you. I don't believe that. Listen, he does. He wants to bless you. Does that mean I'll be a millionaire? That's between you and God, okay? That means I'll live to be 100 years old and never sick. That's, between, that's his will for your life. But I do know this. He wants to bless you. And the thing of it is, I feel guilty sometimes when he does because I, I tell God, I don't deserve this. And the Lord says, I didn't know that. Tell me something I didn't know. You don't deserve it. I, 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 why do you do it? Because I'm good. I like to bless my kids. God is good. I want to bless my kid. It's not about me being good or being worthy of it. Forget that. It's about the fact that God is good and wants to bless you. Another reason why you can pray selfishly like that is that he loves to glorify his name by blessing you. He, you're a testimony. When people see how the Lord blesses you, whatever it may be, they look at you and say, your God is pretty good. I've seen how he's helped you through this sickness or through this family problem or through a job situation. Your God is your God must be pretty good. He wants to bless others as you give testimony to his good name. I'm going to tell you something that's not going to impress you very much. But I'm an ordained Baptist minister, but boy, sometimes. At our college group at Indiana Avenue, we had a, a, several of the tech football players in our college service. They loved the Lord so much. And I knew whenever they would win a game that they would give glory to God. You, you would see the, the channels out there, and they'd be going, I want to thank Jesus Christ, or I want to thank the Lord for this. They're giving God the glory. 
And I did this one time, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but we were playing Penn State University in Happy Valley, Pennsylvania. Joe Paterno, they had just won the national championship a few years earlier. They were a national power. Tech in 1991 or two was not a national power, I promise you. And uh, first, but first game of the season, third quarter, Texas Tech is beating Penn State 22 to seven. By the time I get to my car, start heading home, now I turn it back on. The fourth quarter is about over, about 14 seconds. And Texas Tech is ahead 22 to 20. And Penn State is lining up for a 47 yard field goal. And here's what this really strong believing man did. I pulled off the side of the road. Dear God, I pray this guy would miss that field goal. <laughs> Because if he does, I know that our players are going to give you glory. They're going to bless you because you bless him, dear God. And then Jack Dale says, it's got the distance. It's got the leg. It's good. And I was like, bummer. I'm not going to vote for you, God, next time you run for office. And then in the Cotton Bowl in 1995, 96, we played USC, Southern California. And, man, they were strutting out there, you know, and they looked really good. And our guys came down and prayed in the end zone right in front of us. We were at the game. And they had their hats off. And I was like, look, Lord, look, 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 check it out. They're praying. These guys are strutting. These guys are praying. Bless these guys, okay? And when they win the game, they're going to say, praise God. He did it for us and all that. Well, with two minutes left in the game, it was 55 to 7 in favor of USC. And we finally scored a touchdown to make it 55 to 14. And our tech player went to the stands, went like this, like, I am bad. No, shut up. <laughs> you got your tail kicked, dude. But I prayed that they would bless they would win so they could bless God. But God wants to bless you so you can praise him through this and bless his name. And the third is so we can bless others. That's the main thing. Never mistake this. God is going to bless me in order I can to bless somebody else financially, encouragement-wise, whatever it may be. But anything that God does in my heart, he wants to flow through me to somebody else and hug it for myself. It was my wife and I, it was our, it was our second Christmas together. And we'd already had a little tradition. We just started, really, called this. You get $25 and buy me something. I get $25 and I'll buy you something. And back then, 25 bucks, you could get something pretty good. Like a, I had a nice sweater picked out. Real nice sweater at Dillard's. Ugh. But we got down to Waco and Sarah went out with one of our, her high school friends. And her high school friend, this is about December 20th or whatever, right before Christmas, uh, her husband had just left her around Thanksgiving about three or four weeks earlier. Had no money, had nothing, just ran off. And, and so when Sarah got back home, she was really down and she said her husband just left her. She's got no money for Christmas and all this. And she said, I've, I've got an idea. And that's, <laughs> that scared me <laughs> for some reason. When you got an idea, what are you going to tell me? Why don't we do this? Why don't I take my 25, you take your 25 and put it together and get $50 and give it to her and her family. Of course, outside I was going, yes, yeah, be nice. Inside I was going, bummer. I don't want to do that. You give, I'll tell you what, I'll give my money. You keep your 25 bucks and buy me the sweater. <laughs> I was thinking that anyway, but then she came back home a little bit later and she had, a, I think, a check. It's like a certified check where you can't tell who sent it to you. And I was like, hey, if she's going to get my money, got my sweater money, I want her to know it came from me. Oh, well. About a day or so later, we went over there to have supper with them before Christmas. And when she opened the door, she was been crying and she hugged us and kind of whispered to us. And she said, you won't believe what the Lord did today. And uh, she, I, I forgot about it, to tell you the truth. He sent us $50 from someone, and now I'm able to buy toys for my kids for Christmas. And, you know, I could feel the light from heaven going down with the big letters, jerk, jerk. <laughs> what a jerk. And you know what? To this day, that's the best present I've ever received is watching those kids play. Listen, when God blesses you, he wants you to bless somebody else, and you ought to be excited to be able to do something for somebody else as God has done it for you. But I have a problem. I don't want to pray for myself. Second is this. I don't want to bother God. I don't want to pester God for anything. I just don't. I don't like people pestering me. You don't like it either. It's kind of like, God, I'll ask you for one time, and if you don't do it, I figure you don't want to do it, so I'm through, you know. I've got anything I need right now anyway. Look, Christ is saying this, that the man gave his friend the three loaves of bread, not because he was friend, but because he kept bugging him. Last week, Sam talked about the widow and the unrighteous judge. The widow kept going to the unrighteous judge. He didn't like her. He didn't believe in her God. Did fooey with her, but she kept bugging him about doing something. And finally he said, I don't like you. I really don't. I don't believe in your God. I trust, but I'm going to do it so you'll get off my back. Leave me alone, woman. You're killing me. When's the last time you bugged God for something? 
he tells you to do it right here. I'm, I don't like to do that. I feel like, I'm, I feel like I'm, he might think I'm complaining about this. The words say, ask, seek, knock. And it really means this, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. To keep on in your persistent prayer, a couple of reasons. To see if you're serious about what you're praying about. Are you really serious about what you're praying about? And sometimes it may take years, not months, not days, not weeks. It may take years of prayer before you see the Lord actually answer a prayer in your life. There's a man named Simeon who was prayed, was told by the Lord, said, you will see the Son of God before you die. And he waited and prayed and prayed all of his life. And when Mary and Joseph took Jesus into him, he just like, oh my, it's him. He's here. I've been praying for him all of my life. <clears throat> a little woman named Anna was there at the same time, fasting and praying all for years, waiting to see Christ. And she saw him and she could not believe. It, sometimes it takes years and years to do so. Are you serious about what you're, you're praying about? And the second thing is to keep you in an attitude of prayer. You see, some of the most dangerous times in our lives is not while we're praying for God to do something. It's when he answered the prayers and we quit. You see, ask, keep on asking. Seek, not keep on doing so. Because a lot of times, when God will answer our prayers, we say, thanks a lot, Lord, see you later. And that attitude of prayer goes away, and we start getting further away from God. And God says, you know, I, you've been better off me not to answer that prayer in your life. You think, you think about a King Uzziah. The Bible says he was strong, he, he was strong, and then, as long as God helped him, and he was walking with God until he became strong. When he became strong, he no longer walked with God. His strength made him turn away. From the Lord. You think about the Jews going to Jericho, the most fortified city in the world, and they're praying and praying and praying and marching around and finally praising and shouting, the walls come down. The most fortified city, the oldest city in the world, they brought it down with the praises of God and shouts because they were so desperate for God. They go to a town a short time after called Ai, a small town, nothing, and they got, they got racked. They got routed there because they no longer prayed anymore. Four years ago, I had a serious type of surgery, and I wasn't worried about dying. Uh, that'd be kind of okay, to tell you the truth. I, I know I'd be with Christ. But, uh, you know, basically, I'm a man, and men are babies. We hate pain, right, girls? No, I can't. Amen. I've got a, my first amen. We're babies. I wasn't worried about dying. I was worried about, where are you going to stick me? Is it going to hurt? <laughs> where are you going to put that? <laughs> You've you got to catch me first. <laughs> and so I was praying the whole time, about a month out. And was I desperate? I guess so. Was I terrified? Not really, but just anxious, I guess so. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, and we got so close to the Lord. My wife and I prayed every night, and we had the best time doing that, and just got so close to each other, to the Lord. I had a prayer before my surgery, actually. I said, Lord, I pray once I have my surgery and I get well, I'll pray I will still have this feeling of need and desperation that I can't even take a breath without you. I've got to have this. It'd be better off to be sick with Christ and be well without him. Boy, that's pretty good, okay? I've got, and to tell you the truth, I must, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I don't think I've had that desperation, but I, I'm better than I was. But there's sometimes, folks, it's better to be in need in an attitude of prayer than have everything you need at the moment you quit praying. God's gonna say, I need you praying because you're talking to me. You're talking, being like a, a parent. Your kids are talking to you and they're conversing and you're explaining stuff and, and finally you give them what they need and they run off and don't come back. You go, I wish I hadn't given it to them. I wish they'd stay with me for a while so we could fellowship and we could talk. And the third thing I don't like about prayer or I have a problem with is this. And don't hate me because I think you're in the same boat. I'm not always sure that God is good or that his plans are best for me. Ooh. I'm not always sure that God is good or his plans are best for me. I can feel the crosshairs. Oh, I'm going to... <laughs> But you do it too. I guarantee you do it. We all do. Because if I really believe that, why do I worry when God asks me to do something? Why do I hesitate? Why do I negotiate and bargain and try to get out of it? Something inside of me says, I don't believe that's good for me. I've got to say that. Otherwise, I'd be going, let's do it. Let's go. You say, we go. It's done deal. And talks, Romans 12, 2 talks about his will being good, acceptable, and perfect just for you. Have you ever heard of the, the Texas Running Company or Texas Running Store? I've got these shoes up here. And what they do is that you walk on a treadmill and they film what you, as you walk to see how your foot pronates or does this or that. Then they fit your foot perfectly. These fit terrific. I mean, it's a perfect fit. They've done that. God's will for you is a perfect fit just for you. It's acceptable, it's good, and it's perfect just for you. But do you always believe that? I'm not sure. 
I wish I could tell you I did, but I, I can't. Sometimes I hesitate. Sometimes I balk. <laughs> you know, I'm going, are you sure, God? Here's a blank check. No, no blank check. I'm afraid what you're going to write on that check. Maybe I don't want to cash it. I had a guy praying for me, praying for our group one time. <laughs> and uh, I asked him to just close this in prayer, okay? Just a normal close this in prayer. And the guy got up and started praying. And while he was praying, he did this. And God, I want you to do anything in Russ Murphy's life that will bring him to walk with you, bring him down, whatever you got to do to break him down. And I'm going, that's a bad man. Do not hear him, God. That's a bad boy over there. And even when Sarah sometimes prays, she'll go, Lord, do whatever you got to do to break us down. I'm going, no, don't do that to me. <laughs> you might hurt me. You know what, though? I've got to admit, there's sometimes I just don't always believe it. Oh, I believe it in my heart, but I don't act like I believe it in my head and the way I walk all the time. My prayer is that I would say yes to God before he gave me the instructions. Yes, it's just done. Done deal. Blank check, open book. You write it. It's all, this is your life. You're everything I need. Your every breath that I take. The last few verses there, he talks about being the good father there. He says, you know, basically, if you ask for this, is he going to give you a scorpion or an egg? No. And if your daddies who are basically sinners treat you that good, think how much better your heavenly father will treat you. So Christ is saying here, pray expectingly, believing that God loves you with all of his heart and what he has planned for you is good. It's a good thing. You can pray for God's will in your life. It will be a good, good thing. The, uh, right before Christmas, my seventh grade year, I noticed that my dad was working 12 hours a day. He was commuting an hour and a half from Waco to Fort Worth, working 12 hours to eight o'clock that night, commuting back home, getting home about 9.30 or 10, going to sleep and doing it all again for about a month. And you know, he, was, he was always gone. He was always coming in very late to grab a quick bite to eat and go straight to bed. And uh, at Christmas, under the Christmas tree, and I knew it was coming, I, I kind of thought it was coming, I got my first electric guitar. My dad had bought Les Paul, Gibson Les Paul guitar, great guitar. And uh, my stepmother told me later, that's what your dad was doing that month of going those 12 hour days to pay for your guitar, my first guitar. Now listen, my dad's a good man. And Christ is saying this, if your daddy would do that for you and your dad is a sinner, think how much more your heavenly father will do for you and love you in this way. And so when I pray now, I can say, God, listen, you told me to pray for myself. It's your word you told me to. And God, you told me to bug you sometime. And I need to believe as I pray that you're good and that you love me. And whatever you're going to do for me is going to be for my benefit, for my good. I've got to believe that. That will help me. My time at Indiana Avenue Baptist Church was such a beautiful time there. We started with nine students in 1989, and we prayed so much, long and so hard that God would just do something through this group. And uh, it wasn't so much how big you get, just do something to help us reach the campus. That's where I went to school, Texas Tech. That's where my wife went to school. We loved that school. It's, it's, it's always in our heart. And uh, we prayed and prayed and prayed. And about 1997, uh, our group got to over 1,000, about 1,200, and stayed that way for about three years or six semesters. And once we got to that 1,200, 1,000, 1,200 mark, I really noticed, I really thought, you know, God, there's a magic, there's a magic number you're going to give us. And when I, I reach that, then I'm going to say, good, done deal, satisfied. And we got there, and I was so excited. I'm not against anything big. It's great. I love it. But I realized there was something missing in my heart and in my life that the satisfaction of having a bunch of people was no longer just satisfying. You know what I mean? There was something just missing in my life. So I went to Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn up there to their Tuesday night prayer meeting with Jim Cimbala and those folks. And uh, Chris has been there. And the, the, the thing starts at 7 o'clock on Tuesday nights. We got there at 5.30 because our ride took us there early. So we thought we would get there at 5.30 on Tuesday nights. And then we would see people back by the coffee pot just talking and having just fellowshipping. But when we got there, the place was half full at 5.30 and people were streaming in still. The place got to overflowing before the night got there. And... When we got there, all across the front was, were men and women up praying and singing. There were people singing together over here, people kneeling over here. In other words, the prayer service starts as the moment you walk in the building, the moment you walk in the room. It's done. You're not there to fellowship, really. You're there to pray. And boy, I, I was so touched that night. And they prayed for me. They put hands on me, a stranger, and they prayed for me. And I was like, gosh, that's... And the Lord revealed what I'd, I'd been missing the past few years, and that was that daily passion and hunger of praying to him about needs in my life. Now I prayed, now I thanked God for a lot of things, but coming to him with that, God, I just want to know you. God, I, I've got to have you in my life. It hadn't been there in a while. That's what I was missing. 
And when I got back, we started our, our Wednesday night prayer time with our college group. It was, it was the most enjoyable time because we had three groups. We had the J group. Jesus, you go over here for whatever you want to do. You can pray. You can read scripture. You can sing. Others, you go over here. We're going to pray for your friends, for your mom and dad, people like that. You, J-O-Y, you, we're going to pray, you're going to pray for yourself and let your needs be known. It was a wonderful, wonderful time, powerful time. And then we started a thing called uh, this is our, our lunchtime, our midday noon prayer times. And it was incredible too. For two years, we never missed. And what happened there? I can't tell you. It was just us being with God. And it was such a marvelous, marvelous time that I will never, ever forget that. And one thing Jim Simbla said was this. He said, he's talking to me, he said, Mr. Murphy, it's not what we do on Sunday mornings or Sundays is so great here. They had about five or six services that were just packed. It's not so much what we do on Sunday morning that defines our church. It's what we do on Tuesday nights, our prayer time. That's the defining of our church. How that goes is how the rest of our church goes. Now, the worship time is important. I'm a worship leader. I love worship. But it's going to be directed by what happens on Tuesday. Uh, I love hearing a good word, a good message, teaching. I love the fellowship. All good stuff. But he was saying... What our, how our church goes is what's going to happen on Tuesday night by our prayer time there. And I'm so excited that y'all have started your Monday night prayer time here. I mean, it's, what a cool, wonderful thing. I believe God wants this church to change the entire city, the entire world. And he, I think he wants to start that. This is a good night. Thanks for being here. Keep coming. Tomorrow's going to be good. But what you do on Monday nights, oh, that's where the real power comes. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't made that commitment yet, you ought to come on Monday nights. And if, I was, if we lived here in Lubbock, uh, chances are we would go to this church and we'd be with you on Monday nights praying because that's where the power of God is going to come from in that time. Did you know we started praying for you about seven or eight years ago? We prayed for you, but we didn't know it was you. See, we were asking God back in Indiana, please raise up someone, some group, some church to really just blitz this entire community, entire area. If you don't want it to be us, that's fine. But raise somebody up, and that somebody, guess what? Here you are. You were prayed for eight years ago before I even knew what you looked like or you had a name or nothing. We were praying for somebody to do that, and the Lord is doing that here for sure. Uh, The book of Acts, it talks about the time of refreshing. The book of Acts basically says this, is that Jesus, the son, the groom, we're the bride, he's ready to come back for us right now. But he is being restrained in the heavenlies until the time of refreshing comes. Now, when the time of refreshing comes, after that, Christ will come back for his church. What is that time of refreshing? It's that time when revival will actually just penetrate the earth like we've never seen before in our lives. And that revival is going to start somewhere. And my question today is why can't it start here? It's going to come. The revival will come. It's a done deal. It will happen somewhere, sometime, somewhere. And why not through you? You as a person. You as a group. It's going to start with some body, some church. And why not now? God, why not us? Why not now? And that kind of thing will start because of a Monday night type prayer situation over there for that too. I'll, I'll tell you something. I know mo- most of you here, if you're like me growing up, you just didn't really think that much of yourselves. And if somebody said to you personally, not as a church, but you as a person said, do you know you can pray and change the world? You go, no, <laughs> not me. I've done some bad things. I've done some stupid things. You don't even know my, you would, you would give me a thousand reasons the same I'd give to you too, saying I can't do it. But I will tell you this, as long as you've got a breath of life, as long as you can pray, you can make a difference in this entire world. I mean, a difference in the entire globe. I was singing up in LaGrange, Kentucky, year and a half ago, and I was getting tuned up and all the kind of stuff as you get ready for a concert, working my tracks. And two old ladies came in and sat on the second row. I didn't know them. It was my first time there. I'd never spoken to them. One was 80, one was 88, I believe. Anyway, and I was staying there, and I didn't know them. And out of the, out of the blue, a real nasal old lady voice said, are you a preacher? <laughs> it's like, yes, ma'am, I am. I'm, I play guitar and sing, but I also speak. She went, ain't nothing wrong with that. I said, thank you. <laughs> Glad you approve. Tune some more. Rah, 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 rah. Yeah. Said, uh, are you a minister? I said, yes, ma'am. I couldn't see for the lights. Yes, ma'am, I'm a minister. I'm an ordained minister. Thank you. She said, ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and then she's asked this question. I was going, I'm, this is a strange person. <laughs> then she says, uh, are you a Baptist? 
I was like, ooh. Because it wasn't a Baptist church. It was a cowboy church. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Baptist. She said, and here's what the thing. She said, I used to be a Baptist. I said, ooh, here we, got, we got a story. We got to hear this, okay? And the Lord was talking to me because if I was 25 years old, I would try to correct her in her theology. I could hear the Holy Spirit going, just shut up. Let her talk to you. You might not agree, but she will bless you if you'll just shut up. Listen. Walked over. Well, tell me about what happened. She said, I was a Baptist, and I was out in the field one day working. And I said, Lord, I want you to touch my life like you've never touched it before. And she said, she's telling me now. She started, my hands started to tingle. And I started to get like electricity in my legs. And I was on the ground. I couldn't even get up. I couldn't even speak. And uh, she said, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And I said, well, God, thank you. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost too. Thank you for telling me that story. She said, the, the God, doctors told me at least three times I was going to die, and the Lord healed my life. I said, Dad, thank you so much for telling me that story. And then she said, without any kind of breath, she said, I ain't going to stay for your concert. Because <laughs> I was singing at 9.15, it started at 8. She said, I got to be home by 9.30. I said, okay, maybe I'll see you some other time. So my part of the concert started about 9.15. I'm singing, doing my songs. And I, I'll sing some songs about my grandparents, my grandmother's prayers and all that. Had my grandmother pray for me and whatever. And at 9.15, she was still there. I thought she would try to get a running to the door, you know, head start, because she had a walker. She was slow getting in. So I thought she got to leave sometime. But 9.30 came, she's still there. 9.45, 10 o'clock, 10.15, she, still, she hadn't moved. And a horrible thought went through my mind. I thought, is she dead? <laughs> Did she die? Are you still alive, ma'am? And I went ahead and got through at 1045, and uh, I was going back to the product table to shake hands, and she was right behind me. She was right behind me. And I was like, man, and she can move pretty quick, to tell you the truth. And I got there, and she sat right to my left and about three feet away, put her walker there, and she, I was talking to people. I looked over, she went, just take care of these people. Just take care, okay. I thought, okay. So I got through about 1115. She's probably home a long time ago. And finally, I got through, and she comes over. I said, you know, I think she's mad at me. I, I said something to hack this woman off. She's 80 years old. I'm going to get beat up by an 80-year-old woman. It's going to be embarrassing. So she got the walker, and she leaned back against it. And she's like real bossy. She said, come stand in front of me. She's going to hit me. She is going to hit me. I cannot believe it. I may be leaving this world from... This is embarrassing. So I stood right in front of her. I was like really nervous. Like, <laughs> she said, no, take my hands. So she gave me her hands. I squeezed. I said, At least she can't hit me. She might kick me to death, but she can't hit me. I got her hands. I ain't letting go. <laughs> she said, look at me. <clears throat> Just boss me. I looked at her. She said, no, look in my eyes. And so I looked in her eyes, and she had those pretty blue eyes, and just tears just welled up, started coming down her cheek. And she said, the Lord brought you here tonight just for me. And I said, I don't understand. She said, I'm 80 years old. I can't even walk hardly anymore. I thought the Lord could even use me. My life counted for nothing anymore. But you talked about your grandmother and how she prayed for you and how she just led you to Christ, basically. Even when you got away from the Lord, she prayed for you back to the right fellowship with Him. She said, I've got some grandkids. Do you think I could pray for them like your grandmother prayed for you? I said, you sure can. And I said, I want to tell you something. You've already blessed my life tonight. She said, for the first time in years, I'm going to walk through that door tonight, feeling like my life counts for something. I want to tell you something as the individuals here, okay? Not just as a group, but you personally. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what things you've done or haven't done or supposed to have done or any of that stuff. But I do know this. I think she was teaching us today, as long as you're breathing, as long as you're conscious, as long as you can pray, you can touch somebody else's life. In fact, as long as I'm alive, I should be touching somebody. It may not be Billy Graham. It may not be Chris Galanis or Clayton. It may be you and one person, you and a grandkid, you and a parent, whoever. But as long as you're alive, the Lord wants you to be touching somebody else's life through him. And today I want to pray for you as you think about this city and you think about the prayer times. I want you to know that as you pray, you can rock the world. A while ago, I think I said it. Is that prayer really is, is it asking God for things? Sure it is. Is it praising God for things? Sure it is. Here's what really prayer is. Prayer is when your heart and the heart of God becomes one. And when that happens as an individual or a church, it's totally impossible to imagine what God can do in and through you. He's going to start that revival somewhere, sometime, someplace, through someone, through some church. And I'm asking for you tonight as your friend and somebody who lived here for a long, long time to say, God, why not here? Why not us? 
why not now? Would you pray with me, please? Before we close today, what we talked about today basically was for people who are already believers in Christ, who have Christ in their life. If you're here today and you're not really sure that you have a relationship with Christ, God through Jesus Christ, His Son, that's the prayer you need to pray today. The prayer where you say, Lord, I invite you into my life to forgive me for my sins. I want to serve you. I want to follow you all of my days. Commit my life to you. And when I mess up, I want you to pick me up. But I want to start fresh and new by trusting Christ for salvation in my life. And the thing of it is, the Lord loves you so very, very much. But he never went anywhere. We're the ones that turned away. That's a, I did. He was there. And I turned away. And I've tried to get back to him a long time ago through trying to be good. And I couldn't be good enough. I promised these things I wouldn't do or would do. I never did it right. And you can go to church. You can know your Bible. You can read. You can pray. You can do a lot of great things. And I hope you'll keep on doing those things. But what really gets you back to God, that separation, is his son, Jesus Christ, putting your faith in him. You can do that today. Romans 5, 8 says that, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's no other way but Jesus Christ. John 1, 12 says, but as many as believed in him and on his name, to them he became the right to become a child of God. You become a child of God by trusting in the name of Jesus Christ. And today you can sure do that, and I pray you will. Father, I pray for this church. This is something we prayed for years ago and didn't even know what we were praying for. So I thank you for the leadership here. I thank you for every person here. And I thank you for the fact that every single person here is so important in your kingdom. And I believe there could be somebody here today that you'd be the one to start the revival, the refreshing, before your son Jesus comes back to take us home. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.